I'm a doctoral fellow with the Mountain Assemblages Project at the University of Westminster. Uh, I'm really, it's, I'm really delighted, and it's, it's a privilege to introduce uh, Andreas uh, Philippopoulos, uh, Mihalopoulos, uh, 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 to the second issue uh, conference. Um, Andreas works with performance, photography, and text, uh, as well as sculpting, sculpture, and painting. He has performed at the 58th uh, Venice Art Biennale, the 16th Venice Architecture Biennale, uh, the Tate Modern, the in Hotem in Brazil, which I really want to visit. Um, the Danish Royal uh, Cast Collection, the Royal Music Academy of Sweden, um, the London College of Communication, uh, the Arbeit Gallery, the, the Tokyo Palace in Paris, and many other places. Um, he's a fiction author with his first book, The Book of Water, published in Greek, and to be published in English by Eris Press. He is also a professor of law and theory at the University of Westminster and founded and, and is the director of the Westminster Law and Theory Lab, uh, as well as permanently affiliated with the University Institute of Architecture in, in Venice since 2009. His academic books include the monographs Absent Environments, published in 2007, and Spatial Justice, Body, Lawscape, Atmosphere, published in 2014. Andreas, to me, uh, is also one of those very rare, very, very rare scholars who shows us the possibility of sanity and breadth in continental atmospherics. That its experiments, its fungibility, its lawscapes and geomobilities are indeed porous, leaky, and insistently fragile. That they require a particular kind of care uh, within uh, their pouring disturbance. In this talk uh, slash performance today titled Tracing Submergence, uh, he will be discussing his latest work with Jan Hogan, weaving work on atmospherics and fiction and his latest novel, uh, And Our Disturbance, which is and our, Dist and, and our Distance Became Water, which I look forward to read when it's out. Uh, this collab is available to view at the Daniel Arnard Gallery till the 1st of December. The format is straightforward, uh, Andreas presents, and then we have questions and a chat. So over to Andreas. The first thing he did when he woke up was to look around him. The walls of his room were rocking. The large roses, the central feature of a wallpaper he never chose, were floating against the beige foliage. He held his breath. If he didn't move, if he didn't stare the air, maybe then the roses would calm down. He exhaled as softly as he could and the room finally settled. Now he could breathe again. He got up and opened the door. Everything was swaying. He knew this trick wouldn't work for the rest of the house, but he thought he'd try it just in case. They had left him some tea and biscuits on the kitchen counter, but she started eating slowly, careful not to drop any crumbs. The kitchen faced east, and the light was usually bright yellow. The cupboards had already started lulling up and down the way they usually do in the early evening when dinner is prepared. The only thing missing was the clunking of the cutlery as they got ready to sit at the table. He held his breath again, but he quickly gave up. He placed his cup in the dishwasher and opened the kitchen door. The water had risen noticeably during the night and the waves were crashing against the doorstep. Nothing too ominous. Soft, round waves lapping against the doorstep. He took off his pyjamas and stepped into the water as quietly as he could. The light was almost horizontal. The surface was flat, polished metal. And on it, wavelets, light and honey soft teetering sideways and around, just as he imagined waves in a fjord would. He sunk his head in the water and looked around. There was a gurgle of activity, seaweed, fish, pebbles reflecting light and then disappearing. 
dunes moving along the seabed mirroring the waves above, green and gold. He let the first bubble go and waited a little. After the second one, the water started to forget him. When he finally let go of all the air inside him, the whole watery mass with its grainy sandy bays and all the seaweed, fish and pebbles had stopped moving. Everything expanded like a wave of time, gigantically slow. They had forgotten him somewhere amidst their folds. They let him observe the pause. He was content. This time, it took less than usual. Part one, the drawing. We start with a continuum, and the continuum is neither just human nor non-human. It is something in between. It embraces bodies that do not necessarily communicate with each other. It floats on collectivity. When Jan and I put together a paper ink, water, um, gold leaf. We try to refrain from either assigning or distributing agency. We're trying to allow this to happen. The big question of our era of the Anthropocene is how to withdraw from this manic center. How to deal with the fact that we are ubiquitous Yet, our attempt should be to stop being central. What we've tried to do is think about an ontology of a draw, a way of thinking of things without us, a way of erasing our arms and allowing the thing to happen. Of course, we had no illusions. Nothing can happen without us. Nothing of this sort. Nothing of any sort nowadays. But we wanted to try. And we wanted, of course, not to erase our agencies, but to withdraw from this, from this manic confirmation of agency. That's the kind of thing that we're talking about when we talk about an ontology of a draw, um, another space a way of thinking about our absence or a way of thinking of, uh, of the way that we extend. Much of this, we were distant. Jan was in Tasmania, in Hobart, and I was in London. Both of us locked up in our individual lockdowns. We had withdrawn, and we tried to find other ways of connecting, subaquatically, without engaging. So we did what we did when we were together in Tasmania. We allowed agency to emerge. We didn't lead, neither of us led. We were following and each one was following the other. A crazy circularity. And we just didn't know anymore who was who was doing what, we were confusing our hands. The papers were changing continents, we were crossing time zones. We we're following the material. Japanese paper, sumi ink, water, 24 karat gold. We we're hoping the writing will be non-representational. We we're hoping that we we're going to go against the hylomorphia. 
we're going to play a little bit here somehow. It was beyond this. It's such a bore when you try to impose your sense of rhythm on me. Ebb and flow, streams and currents, waves and tsunamis, you study my comings and goings and note it down in order to catch it next time or to not be caught unawares by me. You use me to relax or stimulate yourselves. You count waves to sleep. You count oceans as if they were human syncopated breaths. What annoys me most is your obsession with enclosing me, channeling me, controlling me, putting me in narrow waterways or large deposits, trapping me in reservoirs, framing me behind long dams or in tiny tubes. No, you don't understand. You don't hurt me. You cannot hurt me when you do these things. It's your attitude that irritates me, that bossy, pitiable, macho egomania with which you think you can control me, and your automatic tendency to measure me, weight, speed, density, frequency. But let's focus on your planet for a moment that hydrospheric apparition on stilts in the great hall of the cosmic gossip. Even then, you think of me as percentages. Oh, wow, so much of the surface of the Earth. So, no, really, so much of a human body, eye-rolling stuff. But just listen. You see that my breath is deeper and more cavernous than your deepest history, caught in the rattle of a dying sun, hidden under strata of a geology that ignores you, deep in the center of what you call your planet, and with whose body you will never manage to sleep. My breath is liquidity in waiting, tangled with chunks of eternity. When we tried to make the physical object, we decided to put things together in a way, in a way that will make a structure, but also will capture the way that the structure pervades. Part two, stitching. We allowed the emergence of legal structures Stitching keeps structures together. It aligns, but somehow without imposing. It's the first time I ever stitched. It's perhaps the most memorable part of the whole experience. Jan showed me how to stitch in a very interesting way, a rectangular yet open way. We, we tried to visualize a certain identity and a certain difference. But we also try to honor the ruptures of the continuum. We try to identify a difference. We try to understand how bodies are different and they are at a distance from each other. They have different velocities. They have different ways of connecting and disconnecting. Bodies are always collective, but then they often overlap. What we try to do with the stitching is understand how one thing can be contiguous, yet different. We aim for a planetary jurisprudence, both through our distance and our propinquity. We wanted to play with a mineral circularity, whether when we were in different time zones or when we were at the, art of the School of Creative Arts in and Hobart. It was a very deep sense of geology, but we couldn't understand it. We were digging deeper and we couldn't find anything. And then we decided to do it the other way around. We decided to start filling it up, as it were, creating the strata the other way around.
my white is blue. So is my slow green, my oily black, my spirited azure, or my dirty gray. All blue, really. Whenever there is light, I catch it, play with it, absorb it as if needed. Why not make it happy? Light has always been a good friend, really. Even so, I'd not welcome it all. I choose only the parts I want. Picky cobalt peacock me. And then I scatter them around like phenomenological fireworks. Dot them like big bangers on the world's retina. See how cool I am? Seamlessly moving between philosophical parlance and street. That's another story, another great quality of mine. We're now talking about my color. So if there is light, I reflect it all blue and cocky. If there's no light around, I wait. Eons of waiting, network of a universe that forgets its own self, but light always comes. So it is blue, even when my white mountains, ice peaks of my consistency, and scraping skies of my polar glory glisten, slide, and melt. It is blue when my powdery white cousins up, crevices of raw thaw, bubbling up with my seas underneath. It is still blue when it devours your cities and your minds. Still blue when it creeps in your mouths, yellow with acid and death, gleaming like radioactive enamel spread over your graves. It is still blue when you scatter colorful flowers around your floating deads. It is blue when red with charcoal frenzy in the deepest core of your planet. And it is blue between your tall buildings and those hot summer evenings when even the breath of your lover is a skin too many. It is blue when you let yourself fly in me, cutting my globules in thick splices, spreading your dream body's light and wavy across time. It is blue when caught on the wings of a bird, and it is blue when mixed with the green iguanas of the deep. It is blue when you shut your eyes, and it is blue when you open them. It is blue when I rush down, shards of transparency drumming the top of your heads like night thoughts. And it is blue when you piss me, yellow reminders of dehydration. It is blue when my impasto blends with the above and the below. Sky and sea, their edges are always deferred. Steam and myopia, the curve of every star, the horizon that opens with every new wave. It is blue, that round thing that moves slowly, with you balancing on its crust, a shawl of suspended lakes, as deep as the weather trailing around it. Part three, gilding. We were emerging, but we were also observing. Something like a responsibility was coming to our hands. The water was becoming much more responsive, but not as a response, but as a responsibility. We could understand our human exceptionalism, but not as the ones who were commanding, but as the ones who had the responsibility. Almost to erase ourselves, but failing that, to fit nicely. So we were mining and anti-mining. We were using 24 karat gold, a very strange moment of luxury that we place it on a heap of rubbish, on waste, on something that looked like nothing, and something that we grew very fond of, something that was the outcome of something, but at the same time not. It was, I guess it was an emergence. Um, we were unworking on it. We were allowing ourselves to... Um, to become this, this unworking. We were experiencing a sense of spatial justice, that justice that comes when two or more bodies claim the same space at the same time. We couldn't tell though whether we were two bodies or one. We couldn't tell whether our digital personas are our ways of connecting and disconnecting through Zoom and that dual screen was one or two. We couldn't tell whether we were on the left or the right of the screen. We couldn't tell whose hands were or should be on the left side, whose hands should be on the right side. We also realized that when we are even working together, whether it was in the studio 
or out in, in, in the country. That our bodies were invaders, as it were, by other bodies. It wasn't that our bodies were extending, it was that we almost welcomed the extension of other bodies into ours. We really pulsed with a certain collectivity. We, we, we somehow didn't care. We, we were becoming forests. Um, Deleuze um, famously says that we don't know where the forest starts or ends. We were repeating. We were going through the motions in a way that we didn't, we didn't exactly know where this was going to lead us, but that was fine. That was it. It didn't have to lead anyway. It had to be repeated. That is the way of the mining. That is the way of the digging. That is the way of the unworking. That is the way of, of trying to raise ourselves. Um, we explored our distance when we're locked down on the other ends of the world. And we explored our immersions when we were together and vice versa. We managed to explore both at these different conditions. I don't know how she does it, but she's always eating into my space. A little here and a little there, always, whenever I'm not looking. In the middle of the night, when we finally succumb to our yielding knees and rest. Or in the morning, when I'm looking for something to eat. She pushes the partition I've made, supposedly by accident. He even coughs to cover the splash. But of course I know what's going on. I'm standing there as usual, with my back against the partition knees slightly bend and bang he jolts and throws me off balance and with every new push he inches further into my space the moment i realize i yell and push back but it gets tiring i run out of patience and give up let him have as much space as he wants what is he going to do with it anyway as long as he doesn't leave me with nowhere to stand i'm happy with what i have in any case, when the big one comes, all this will end. Like this woman who's gathering wood every day, or sometimes metal sheets of some sort, God knows where she finds them. She even brought in a whole door the other day. She's put together something that resembles a shack or a phone booth, and she shuts herself in there. She's added some plastic climbers hanging from the ceiling. Why plastic, I ask her. It's not as if we don't have enough water to water them. I haven't got the time, nor the will, she says. In any case, everything is temporary. It's true. They're unsafe. It's a jungle out there. Fights everywhere, bickering over whose is what. Only one thing can save us all, the big one, when it comes, if it ever comes. My grandmother used to tell me what her grandmother used to tell her about how she was standing in the water when years ago the big one came. 
It didn't just come from the horizon, as you would expect. It came from everywhere, at once. A howling rain, so dense you couldn't see your hand. Waters rising with rage, as if the earth had opened her breast, finally ready to let out the cry that would destroy everything. And at the same time, the horizon turned black, and a mile-high wall of water started approaching, slowly like a promise. The waterfall of ages, starting from the feet of an idol god, and charging straight to all those below, waiting with open arms and knees bent from desire. Some mornings, especially when the sun is laid to rise, a whisper stares the water surface. Words dart past us, whistling that something enormous has appeared on the horizon. A boulder of water, perhaps, so dense that it seems opaque and final. But until now, nothing has arrived but clouds, heavenly torns casting their shadows on us. And we, neither human nor beast, remain stranded in the shallows of the lake covering the globe. A lifetime of waiting, tepid and uncreased water barely rising to our knees, each one of us stubbornly confined to our allocated little square of water, drowning in the melancholy of the desire for one more inch of space. Thank you. I was, uh, that was, that was, that was really, really beautiful, Andreas. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that, um, I, I must confess, I was slightly, um, slightly suspicious about the video lag, but it really worked beautifully. And I hope everybody else was also able to um, listen and follow that. Um, uh, so yeah, we have plenty of time for questions. Um, and I, I have a few questions myself, but, um, but yeah, anybody who wants to start is welcome to uh, start. Uh, but but while you think of uh, what you'd like to um, ask or, or discuss, um, uh, you know the the note about the grandmother sort of <laughs> reminded me of my own grandmother, and um, one of my one of my great aunts. Uh, and and it's it's sort of it's not a tradition exactly, but you know when when they cut large jackfruits. Uh, really, really large jackfruits. Uh, you know, they, 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 I mean, we, we need we need a cut a, a, a knife on which you sit, and you know, you you, you break it, you break the jackfruit, and um, you need a you need a bowl of water uh, in which you know you 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 lay the you, you lay the jackfruit pods because it's really sticky, and um, so normally the children around uh, my, my my great aunt would. Um, would would talk about how these pods interact with each other because they're really sticky pods, and you've got to you know in, uh, basically engage in in opening the pod and cleaning it and removing it, but in 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 that opening of those pods and cleaning of those pods in the water, uh, it in you know in within within I mean inside submergence is is where the story happens. So I I, I guess I mean my 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 opening. Uh, question a okay, comment is really uh, about uh, was was there a certain per story that Jan and you wanted to uh, describe or narrate or was it essentially really just um, uh, a process that you wanted to articulate I mean yeah thank you I've always I, I'd love to be there Hash, when your grandmother was doing that so it sounds it sounds wonderful um, I was always fascinated by this idea of family secrets or family stories that go from um, grandmother to mother to daughter. And, um, and I always delighted in this exclusion. Um, I kind of, I don't know, I just always felt there was something, not quite in my family, but I realized that I would never have access to that. Uh, it was a different family and I was kind of, uh, I kind of liked that but I never, had, I never had access to that secret or story. I think it was a recipe, something like that, to be honest. But um, this, was, um, this was a voice. Uh, this was part of, a, um, part of the, the Book of Water, which is going to be published. Uh, it should have been published in September, but apparently September is the worst time to publish after the lockdown, because um, everyone's publishing. 
Um, so we decided to do it in October. Um, and um, it's, um, it's just a collection of stories, different voices. And this one, I think it was this um, daughter, essentially that was talking about, um, about this, you know, this melancholy of, of a tiny, uh, tiny space, uh, water. This came from a dream where um, I was in the water, standing in the water, and uh, the water was like a crude oil. And uh, we were all, everyone was knee deep into that water. And that was sort of, that was the destiny in a way of humanity. It was, <laughs> it was not a nice dream. It was very vivid. And, uh, and it had to find, uh, had to find its way into, into, the sto into a story anyway. Um, but, but I'm glad you mentioned water because, because <laughs> obviously I'm obsessed with water. I, I, strangely, I even, I, I, um, sort of resisted writing about water academically until very recently when I just, you know, decided to bite the bullet and, and just plunge in as it were. Um, but until now I would, I've kept it somehow separately and I realized that it's, um, it's just such an important part of me and I, I'm, I'm still not entirely sure why. Um, but um, just to mention that the, the two uh, fictional sections that you heard in, in, in the middle were the voice of water. And the voice of water comes from a, a, a novel, a book I just, uh, not just, but I, I finished last year. And it's, um, it's called um, And Our Distance Became Water. And it's, um, it, it has, you know, a story, <laughs> obviously, but there is this uh, voice of water that is very cocky, very annoying, very, very um, paternal in a way. I mean, you know, perfectly slappable. Uh, and somehow, you know, it kind of develops as well and it has a bit of a moment and kind of, you know, finally listens to poor little humans. But I, um, to me, this was the, water was the, it wasn't just a symbol, it's an element of um, of how how nothing we are as humans how how we're just part of a thing and and water seemed to be um, the element that allowed me to understand how we might flow along um, and rather than just manically trying to claim space yeah, it reminded me of uh, Astrid and Amonis's book, uh, Bodies of Water, uh, but also the um, some of the notes on extraction and mining uh, reminded me of uh, Natasha Myers's comment on um, uh, a colonial detuning. And I think even, even Dion, Dion Brand uses a similar term uh, to obscure those relations with water. Um, so I was, I, was, I was wondering uh, whether the gold was, uh, I mean, I mean, this is such an arbitrary uh, question, but whether there was a connection between uh, Tasmanian and Australian, uh, you know, imaginaries of gold. Yeah, yeah. And well, I mean, I, I, I'm not quite sure about gold imaginaries, but certainly mining imaginaries, yeah. in, yes, in, in Tasmania in particular, which is a very, um, is, it's a very interesting ecological story going on there between the loggers, the the miners and, and the ecologists and um, but mining is um, yeah I mean as as we all know it's it's something that has been it's being studied and quite rightly um, in, in in from various perspectives and I am very keen on somehow referring to this through the through the work um, but one thing that um, came to mind when we were doing that and especially when we're putting the as it were we're putting the gold back um, there was something that, um, if I may, Mirko um, mentioned in, in, in his PhD um, <laughs> that, and I, I was really taken by it. I was really, I mean, I'm still very much taken by it after how many years is that? Um, that um, one way of, of unworking, one way of sort of doing something which would um, be relevant to this idea of non-production is by putting all the stones, all the, all the material back into the caves that were created and the, you know, the tunnels and also were created by mining. Just put it back, that's all, like nothing else. And I just, uh, I'm, I'm indebted to, to him about this, um, this process of unmining and um, yeah. 
that's 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 really interesting. I, I've I've got to I've got to look up that thesis. Um, but I, I have another question. But but before I ask, I think uh, there's a question from uh, Michaela Koza. Uh, I hope I got her name right. Um, who says thanks, Andreas, for such a wonderful magic work that you shared with all of us. What it reminds me is Barad's concept of uh, diffraction. Would you define your work as a diffractive one? I, I think you you know Michaela, of course, you're you're spot on. I think it's. Uh, I mean, diffraction is a is a process, but it's also a horizon. It's kind of a, a thing that I would like to get to, and um, and in a way, yeah, there's a, there's a con constant attempt or um, desire to diffract, and also I think also the way that Barad uses it to diffract diff uh, diffract ourselves and diffract our own our own role in in all that, and and somehow. Yeah, somehow go into the blind spot or something like that. I don't think we manage. Of course, we don't manage to do that. It's 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 still very much about you know what you do. But then I, it was a really interesting moment trying to think when Jan Hogan and I were trying to think about this. Um, I mean, it all started with this idea, which is a, a it's a moment of diffraction. I we just started with this idea that what happens, brother, can actually the writing write itself at the moment that the you know the ink the water and the paper touch each other so obviously the hands are there and we were you know, we're doing what we're doing but but we wanted to think of ourselves just as as the support as it were of the you know the feather or whatever the, the brush or whatever it is that we had or um and, and just just allow this to happen. So somehow this is why nobody was following, um, rather nobody was leading. It was a question of just just looking at it and just allowing a certain pulse, perhaps <laughs> certain something like this to just yeah allow the diffraction of these of the materials and and the diffraction of the human. Um. I, I don't want to pivot to something. Uh, uh, to, I mean, to another direction. But uh, the the broad uh, the note the broad note, you know, uh, reminded me that you know it, 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 it sort of helped me think about the spatial temporal frame of the experiment, uh, the zone where geology becomes operational uh, as a stage uh, within a box. Um, I mean, like atmospheric science experiments uh, at fluid dynamic centers and atmospheric science labs are all really intimate scale experiments. They are, they're all very tiny, you know, small uh, human scale machines. Um, uh, but I mean, I was, I mean, is, is that something that you were trying to engage with in, the, in, in terms of uh, an alternative or, or to resist that, uh, that, assert, that, that, that's, that's, that's the certainty that a lot of these uh, computational imaginaries provide? Uh, or was it something that, uh, had to be diffused because of water, because water is essentially an unmeasurable subject in fluid dynamics, that fluid dynamics is unable to comprehend, even scientifically, the dimensions of water, um, which, is, which is the case with the monsoon, for example. But um, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know whether this was what we were trying to do. I, I, uh, um, I think I, I was interested in the machine um, discussion that uh, took place on the previous panel, um, and, and and the whole idea of obviously I'm interested in autopoiesis because I've written quite a lot of, on this, and um, and I like I I really am very keen on the idea of of, um, of circular processes, of processes that just um, feed into themselves, and then and then of course there are emergencies that happen when when the various processes repeat themselves and superimpose. And then as they're superimposed, then, then more emerging stuff happens. And, uh, and that's a kind of machine that, um, to, su you know, to some extent, we're trying to emulate. And the water, as you say, is precisely that, is this kind of, you know, um, it, it, it just is uncontrollable. It just, it's, it's, it's the contingent, it's, it's very contingent. I understand that it was very aestheticized. I, I've had, Occasionally, we've had a bit of doubts about this. I mean, whether we, we, we're we aestheticizing too much of the process. 
but then I, I thought, you know, sod it. So what's, what's, what's wrong with aestheticization? I mean, <laughs> so I'm just getting a bit defensive here, but nobody has accused us. It's just that I'm, I'm getting defensive about, about this. Because um, I thought that, I thought that the, the, first of all, the idea of, uh, again, diffraction, the idea of producing difference through difference. Um, but by allowing your hand to follow that, whatever it was, you're absenting yourself. Like, it, okay, so it would be very, I mean, it wouldn't be easy, but it would be feasible to do something like this, which would be quite mechanical. So without hands, like a thing that, you know, like a machine, we can create a machine. But somehow this would not have given the absence that we wanted. It's a very strange um, dialectics, this one. Like, they, in order to have absence, you have to have a trace of presence. And the trace of presence was our presence in, in that thing. And, um, and I think that that's it, that the machine is happening and we are just part of this collectivity. Um, the question is where we stand in the machine. Do we stand in the, you know, pressing the on and off button? Have we accepted the fact that we're just part of the wheel? Um, obviously not. Um, have we accepted the, the fact that the machine will explode probably sooner than later? Some of us. Uh, Renan Neri Porto asks, I mean, uh, comments, Andreas, thanks for, thanks for this presentation, really amazing. A question that I had was how to think individuation with drawing and on water. It is an interesting experience of thinking things in its deforming without organized and, excuse me, uh, without organized and fixed identities. Mm. Individuation. And I decided to kind of, you know, vanish and disappear and become a, become a thing. Um, I don't, I, I, I mean, obviously, thank you so much, Renan. I mean, there, there are several, uh, I think, ways of thinking about individuation. My, I'm a little resistant to, to the idea because I, I wouldn't know exactly how to deal with it, except as a, as a slight tragedy, <laughs> as a sl slightly tragic emergence. Um, at the same time, it's, it's something that, that happens constantly. And it's, uh, um, and it's uh, you know, we, 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 have to, we find ways of dealing with it. Now, um, I can see the hauntology thing here, which is absolutely, absolutely right. Um, I, I, can we, could, I mean, could we, uh, could we think of an individuation as a, as a collective moment, as a, as a kind of, again, as an emergence? I mean, I'm thinking a little bit about Simon Don here, um, as an emergence from, um, fr from qualities that are somehow independent and completely uh, beyond us, as it were. Um, and, but then we, we also, you know, merge into these um, strange assemblages. And that's, that's the moment in, in individuation. There's an agency that is not assigned, it's not distributed, it's an agency that might or might not emerge. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know whether this, this is, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I just want to also encourage people if they wanted to ask a, uh, or comment themselves, they're welcome to let me know and unmute themselves. Um, Mathes uh, says, related to this, I thought that there was a really interesting tension that came up at some point in relation to the lockdown between drawing and withdrawing, and by extension, questions of agency and the way in which the drawing on dust expands itself when the marks are submerged in water. Wow, I really like this. Um, yeah, I didn't. Oh, thank you for that. You know, drawing and withdrawing. I think this is um, my second favorite after the Umwelt and Unwell <laughs> today's. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, you're ab absolutely right. And um, it would, the truth is, they're very, very, very different processes. Um, the, the being together was one process that was um, fun, was, was very tiring, was very intense. We, I had an artist residency for, uh, for about 10 days there and we worked pretty much every day and um, at very different conditions. And, and it, was, um, it, was, it, was, it was splendid. Um, uh, but the withdrawal was happening, um, I don't know, it was happening during the, during the work. Uh, whereas, whereas when we were 
uh, when we decided to carry on with it, with all those one minute videos that you, you were seeing, which was this dual screen Zoom recording, um, and we tried really hard, I think we tried so much to not withdraw. So what we're trying to do is actually find ways in which the two, you know, we have similar bowls of kitchen, bowl. I mean, they were salad bowls, right? So salad bowls, and, and we found out that we had similar uh, floors, wooden floors at some point in our houses. So, okay, okay, let's use that uh, and talk about. So it was, we we're really trying to come together rather than just um, just to absent ourselves. Um, but, but of course, you know, it, 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 never, it could never happen. I mean, th these were, we, had, we have hours of recording um, over the lockdown hours of, of recording. So we just, we made six short films out of this, uh, you know, one minute films and one longer one where uh, it was an absolute pain trying to find ways of, you know, finding similar papers and, and, and using the edges of the screen and kind of, you know, like the screen. Um, so, so there was this, this constant tension, you're abso absolutely right. And, um, and we, were, we were kind of just happy to, <laughs> to see this happening. I mean, one of the questions that I had was also, what were some of the technical difficulties you faced? But perhaps I can also add uh, uh, Ginny Rawlings' question um, or comment, which, uh, which says, I, 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 wa I wondered about the importance of the transcontinental human collaboration and the nature of the drawing. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, well, <laughs> necessity, boredom, I don't know overflowing creativity. I mean, I'm sure you all experienced that. I mean, lockdown, the real lockdown, right? When we were actually locked down, except for, you know, walking a bit and all that stuff and exercising. Um, I don't know. Anyway, it's, everyone with whom I've spoken so far, they, they, they were in, you know, like seventh sky with creativity and happiness. And, and you know, obviously, you know, I, I spoke with, with people who, were, who had a home who were not unwell and who had no huge financial difficulties but um but in that context um artists friend of mine they were always very happy about about that space that time that exploration and so somehow jan and i first of all i think we missed each other and <laughs> we wanted to carry on secondly we actually i, I was supposed to have a different um exhibition with um, the gallery daniel arnaud um in london and venice um and the the, the show would, would coincide with the uh, venice uh, architecture biennale but of course this is cancelled and then we decided that we, we couldn't do it absolutely because of the, the nature of the exhibition so we decided uh, which was going to be an installation performance thing so we decided that we would do something else and and somehow they they liked the work um we contributed to the their 25 years um, show, their 25 years of the gallery show, which is also online and it's a wonderful show and I really would um, advise you to have a look at it. Um, uh, uh, but they, they, they liked it and they said, do, would you like to have a room? <laughs> what do you mean? So, you know, a virtual room to have that. And, and that, was the, uh, that was the beginning. And so we kind of, we, kind of uh, we had already started doing the stuff, but then, then everything became intensified because we, have, we had a final goal. So yeah, technical technical challenges. Um, I think the greatest technical challenge was was the orientation of Zoom. <laughs> I know it sounds ridiculous, but I think we spent. I mean, like I think we spent like about a couple of hours trying to understand which way it is, which way it it's mirrored, and then which way it's recorded, because recording is different to the way you see it. And of course, she saw it differently to my to me. And so that, that bit with the papers, again, I mean, that, was hard to say. that bit with the papers when I had to feed into, you know, transcontinentally to, to Jan and Jan had to feed it back or something like that, was, was blind because I, I, I think, I can't remember, I think we were actually doing it the wrong way. So we, were, we had to do it the wrong way in order to look the right way. So it was, uh, I think this was the greatest um, technical challenge. Um, otherwise, you know, the gallery has been has been wonderful. The the, the room is is really very beautiful. I mean, they're very beautifully made, and and we have a few more stuff there. We have um, uh, some photographs and some text uh, as well. So yeah. Nice. Over to Mirko. Mirko, you had a question. 
Hey, hello. Um, yeah, speaking about the, well, a few things, but speaking about the exhibition, because you brought it up now, I think it's really interesting how different it was also to, to uh, when you go online and go into the space and this, um, yeah. How do well, more performative. Yeah, how, how. yeah, it was a different, uh, quite a different experience. Um, uh, but I was wondering, so where was the, uh, wh where did you place the bowls on exactly? I'm where curious. did you, oh. Yeah, where was the bowl, your bowl sitting on? Um, most of the time was in the kitchen floor. Oh. Uh, but I think the, the original films that never made it into the final thing where it, in the sort of terrace thing and, and Jan mm -hmm. was in her garden because we wanted to show that mine was at that point mine was light and hers was night but <laughs> you know nothing no it made no difference so we kind of gave up on that and then uh, and also it was apparently terribly cold in in Tasmania at that point and it was very hot in London so mm. it's very impractical for both of us um, uh, and then we used um, a metal surface that we found I think it was the desk my desk and, and maybe no, maybe she found a metal sheet as well. Okay, yeah, yeah, because uh, yeah, in relation to that, two things actually, yeah, uh, kit, speaking about kitchen and also family stories with Harsh and, and what you said, and the secrets. I I think what really strikes me is that uh, you know um, your desiring um, complex ratio with, with water. Uh, I I think um, as you know nowadays there's I mean, somewhat in, in eco-criticism and, you know, various materialisms we're dealing with in relation to environment, there is still often such an interesting romanticizing about the water going on somehow. Uh, even maybe it's kind of even more than earth, like now in these elemental terms, but I think it's very curious with what's going on with water uh, for different reasons. But, but uh, what kind of often really slips, I think, away, but what was really present here and it really appreciate it because I'm also in a way uh, in that territory it's actually that you brought you someone really uh, you know that the fact that of course water is life but actually it's that's just a tiny fraction of it it's like a very small zone but the rest of it is really some uh, another uh, type of being that actually cares or does not care for our presence and, and what not but it really it is death and non-life but also death and then uh, related to this, how you in, in a bowl of, you know, salad bowl uh, with, you know, ink and, you know, bits of water and paper, you act, I felt you really, even before you told about your dream, uh, in a way, how, 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 I don't know if that was the intention, but this act, again, a bit of countological, but the summoning a hurricane or, you know, a flood, or a typhoon, uh, the colonial typhoon, you know, to, to, to call now Malcolm Ferdinand here. You know, the fact that actually in this bowl here, it might seem that in this assemblage and, you know, system out of wedding and whatnot, we have some control, even though, of course, you are kind of dissolving it as we go. But again, this might actually, at any possible moments, really, the tide might turn around and it will somewhat. But then the question is, again, now to come back to your you know, was it somehow, yeah, the question is then juridical, really, uh, you know, the how we position one ourselves, right, um, in terms of historical responsibility. And I felt, again, uh, you know, through this, like, you know, art material that, you know, have very deep histories, you know, ink, pen, gold, of course, and invocation of earth and water, somehow, you know, in such a really quotidian space, it's really this the, the kind of, you know, it's really this kind of, kitchen table is the political actually uh, or it can become but it takes a very complex of course it's more than you you know there is John and there is all sorts of other beings but I just felt yeah uh, the, the, the fact that it, it came across also this fact that you know every day even in the kitchen we are not in a safe space of course it's you know it's a tragedy yeah um, and yeah just one last note in a way I also thought as you were speaking about this that you know Vicky Kirby's notion of nature writing itself, how she kind of really, you know, move all our culture and writing, you know, exceptionalism into something which is nature writing itself. But again, uh, um, I think what's added 
here what and you know that really like this pressure responsibility you bring in here so i was just wondering was it somehow present some of this um yeah yeah well, I mean, thank you so much Mirka. of course um i first of all i love the fact that you you mentioned kitchen as a as the political because that that was exactly how it felt i mean it felt like a again it was a kind of a, a i felt like an invitation like a that that you know that kitchen the kitchen invite the kitchen floor the kitchen table invited us and the kitchen you know the salad bowls and all the stuff invited us to to play with them and kind of you know work uh you know political responsibilities through those through the these materials in fact i think we brought all sorts of we probably have some some um some videos with spoons writing with wooden spoons where but then it became a little too um yeah uh, but um, it, I mean, this this is absolutely right that the, the you know we know that the political is everywhere, and we also know that um, these dispositifs, um, especially the ones that are not associated with power, um, are often very effective. Um, I mean, I love the idea of the you know the way the utensils have been um, used in in moments of revolutionary moments, protests and all that stuff in South America, you know, the banging and all that. We were also doing quite a lot of this during lockdown for the NHS. Um, you know, these moments where the kitchen was coming out pretty much. And, uh, and, and so we we're hoping that our kitchens will connect um, somehow. Um, and, um, and, 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 and yes, we, I, think, I think neither of us is romantic about, about water and uh, I'm, I'm happy you, you mentioned this. I I find I find this particular literature on um, you know the new materialist uh, ecological literature on on that on water and other stuff a little too um, kitsch I should say, um, and that's why we, I think we need to draw very much on on literature um, that uses water precisely. Uh, you know very often water is death, and uh, and I'm currently in Venice, which is you know very appropriate, and um, and of course you know water. Is is of course life, but it's also a huge, huge um, death barrier. I mean, it's 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 the promise of 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 collapse. It's uh, it's the the inevitability of of the end. It's 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 a constant challenge, the the everyday challenge for the city, for the for its residents, and all that stuff. Um, but and yet, it's it's life. It's the way that the Laguna. Uh, you know, gives life to the city, uh, etc. So it's neither, it's neither nor. There's this beautiful scene also, um, if I start talking about water, I mean, like, you know, I shouldn't, but there's this beautiful scene at um, Miyazaki's um, Spirited Away, um, two scenes on water. One is the train that goes into the water, but the other one is the, when the, spi no, no, sorry, not Spirited Away, um, Princess Mononoke, which is this ecological, sort of fable but very 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 complex very interesting i, I sh actually show it to my students and the spirit of the forest which is the ecological forest appears and it does something really so the first time i watched it i was thinking i don't understand why is that because it was uh, it was stepping on on sort of water and then something was blossoming so you think okay the spirit of the forest gives life and at the same time as soon as it was stepping further down everything was 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 um wilting and dying so the same step almost was giving both life and death and i thought that's it that's exactly it i mean it's confusing initially because you know disneyfication of 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 cartoons you want the good and the bad you know which is one thing don't confuse us but this is a beautiful moment when you know both these things these things happen uh we're sort of out of time um and I, I think this uh this social arrangement after this <laughs> but i don't know the format of that but if I can very quickly read two comments, uh, I, 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 missed, um, I missed a comment by uh, Roshni. Um, just me, sorry, one second. Roshni Kempadu, who says, thanks, Andreas. Um, uh, Andreas, uh, sorry, my, my, my uh, scrolling is jittery. Uh, thanks, Andreas, and all for great, some great uh, contributions. Andreas, look forward to more conversations that follow on from cover constraints. Um, and Monica Jackal says, uh, I just got reminded to the, to the writer Janet Frame saying, and she quotes, there is no past, present, or future. Using tenses to divide time is like making chalk marks on water. 
uh, in faces in the water, or a bit in the sense as Harsh described water as that which is not definable. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, any closing comments, Andreas or anybody else, you're welcome to take a few minutes more if you like, but uh, yeah. May I just say how honored I felt being invited uh, in this beautiful collective. It's just, it just, it just wonderful that you're, you're doing that, guys. It's just, uh, you know, the, the journal is exceptional. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, like so much good work going in there. And it's, uh, yeah, and it's, I also felt that it's, it's, it's wonderful that I'm invited because, you know, at Westminster, I'm a law professor. I mean, what on earth am I doing here? So I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very appreciative of the fact that you appreciated my other identities. So uh, yeah, good luck with, um, with the, the next issue.